He's Bill Parcells, and uh, going into the Hall of Fame, he joins us now. Coach, got that speech done, memorized? Well, I don't know whether it's memorized or not. I just got a few things I got to say, and I'm going to get up there and say them and get out of the way. How tough is it to try to capsulize an entire career and all the people who have had something to do with it, people you want to thank, memories? Well, there are a lot of people that I'd like to mention, uh, but I'd like to leave time for maybe one one experience or two as well. So I'll try to put it in synopsis form as best I can and and go from there. How close were you to not being a coach in the NFL? Well, that's a good question. I, I In the NFL, I think, you know, I, I never really was aspiring that way when I was a young coach. I, it was really, deci- you're going to laugh at this third one I throw in here, but it was a decision between going into coaching, which I had a strong interest in, going to law school, which I also had interest in, and going to work for a franchise that was in its inception, that I had worked for while I was in college, and the name of that franchise was Pizza Hut. It was just getting underway, and I'd worked for them, and they wanted me to come to work for them. And so I could have been the pizza guy. <laughs> what was the job at Pizza Hut that you turned down? Well, actually, we were, uh, myself and a couple of my college teammates, we were running stores for them on on certain nights of the week and kind of managing the stores and and, you know, doing everything, waiting tables and cooking and doing all that. So, actually, what they wanted me to do is be a franchisee and, you know, expand the franchise, which has happened. Uh, you know, it's worldwide franchise now. But when, when they were talking to me, there were only about six or eight of them. When did you know you were good at coaching? Well, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't know whether you ever think you're good at it. Uh, I, I I thought uh, I thought professionally when in 1984 when we beat the Rams in Anaheim and we won our first playoff game. I can recall, you know, saying to myself, "Hey, Parcells, if you just get your butt in gear, you can do this." So I think that was the time where my confidence got to the point where I I felt I could do it and. And I should be improving as I went from there. Your ego ever get in the way? Oh, yeah. How sure. so? Well, it, you know, it it happens. It happens to you because um, this this profession is not without change. And, you know, you have new ownership and come in and you're already – you know, established as a coach and things change. And I think sometimes your ego can get in the way. I, I think it did with me a couple of times, or at least once for sure. And retrospectively, I think that was a mistake to allow that to happen. You're very good at pushing buttons. Your players, former players would say that. Uh, how did you come to have that character trait where you knew what to say, when to say it, and what reaction you were going to get? You know, I think... Uh, I don't. I don't know that that's the case. I've never believed that that in this coaches being great motivators. I, I really don't believe it. I think if a player is not a self starter, then then you're going to have a difficult time as a coach in the long run getting him to do very much. But I think as soon as you find out that the player will respond to competition, then your job as a coach is to show them where the competition is and. And normally, the player, the, the the guy, the real competitor, they'll respond to that once they see where it is and once you point it out to them. So that was basically the essence of my motivation, just trying to show them where the competition was. He's Bill Parcells going into the Hall of Fame this weekend. Joining us, Dan Patrick Show. Uh, different rules for different players in your career? Well, you know, a lot of people have written that. That's one of the things that always hurt me the most. I tried to be fair. Consistent wasn't the right word. I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in trying to be right. So each situation to me was different and needed to be handled differently. And I think eventually the players learned to respect that. I also wondered about this, Coach, that 
I don't know if you see this parallel or not, but you, Bob Knight, uh, Bill Belichick, Mike Krzyzewski, fair parallel. I know maybe you don't want to be included with Coach Knight because, you know, you respect him so much, but can you see that parallel of mentor, um, uh, pupil, and then, you know, go on to success uh, elsewhere? Well, I think, no, I don't, I don't know how to answer it really, but I think the parallels are that both Bill Belichick, all four of us were exposed to the military academies in one way or another. So Mike Osefsky was a player there when I coached at Army and became friends with Coach Knight. Bill Belichick's father was a friend of mine. He was coaching at Navy, and he introduced me to Bill when Bill was just a young 20-year-old guy. Uh, but I think that's the one, the one common ground for all of us that we'd all ex- been exposed either as coaches or, or a kind of pupils for that military uh, education. And I, I think that stays, I stayed with all of us in some respects. You think you could have been a military guy? Yes, I do. I honestly do, yes. Can you coach in a militaristic way? Can can you or did I? Both. Um, I'd say some aspects of my coaching was a little bit militaristic, but, you know, you have to let them see the other side, too. You can't just be uh, one way. You have to you have to let them know that there's something other than that taskmaster there. And it doesn't always have to come on the practice field or in the locker room. It can come in different situations. I know many players have commented to me over the years, I mean literally hundreds, about those times when it was just myself and them doing something, going somewhere, driving somewhere, walking to practice. Those kinds of things seem to be the more effective ones uh, in terms of my ability to to coach people. How close were you to taking the Saints job last season? Well, boy, I'll tell you, you're asking hard ones this morning. You know, I, I have a very strong fondness for Sean Payton. He, he worked with me. I like him very much. And it was really his, he, he was at the center of this thing, but I do think retrospectively it was very, very smart for me not to do it and probably a lot better for the Saints that I didn't go there. Um, it's it, I, There were just too many things they were going to have to overcome last year. And I, I, I'm not certain that anyone, anyone could have uh, succeeded under those circumstances. The way we view football now to back in the 80s, 70s, 60s, you know, when you talk about a bounty gate, uh, if I brought that up in the 70s about a bounty gate or head hits, what would the reaction have been? And are we overreacting now to something like a bounty gate? You know, it's been around for a long time. And, you know, there were incentives, but not. I never was exposed to one that this bounty gate turned out to be. Or in other words, get this guy out of the game. You, I would never have thought to do that uh, with my team or stood up there in front of some of them uh, and said, you know, we got to knock this guy out. Now, I would say, hey, you know, we need to put Eric Dickerson on his back when he carries the ball. <laughs> I would say that. And that. You know, in, in terms of let him know that this is going to be, a, I, I can remember saying that exact thing. Or the first time we played a goal ball against Bo Jackson, I can remember saying, hey, we need, to, we need to let this guy know he's in a football game, not a baseball game. And those kinds of things. And I guess they could be construed a, a certain way by certain people, but there was no malicious intent there. It was just you know, put the heat on them. Really, that's what it amounts to. Well, I remember being at uh, the games that you guys hit, you know, Montana and hitting good. 
Uh, Jim Bird, certainly with that hit. Um, Leonard Marshall got him. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that blind side right in the middle of his back. Uh, uh, but that, those are football plays. That, that, yes, that's are. not, there's nothing that was where it's, it's um, nothing needs to be said. They're just playing. Those were good, clean hits. Right. So you don't have to say anything. That's just the way your defense played. But here you are taking Montana out of the game. I think sometimes that people try to read into it of what these guys are doing, how they're doing it. Are they doing it with intent? Um, and I think that's where the lines get blurred, though, Coach, when we're trying to well, officiate a game. With, I, I, I agree with you. I do think what's happened that we've added the variables. We've added to the number of variables that can occur in the game. And that, in, a, in itself, increases the di- difficulty of administering the game. And, you know, it, was, it used to be we just had uh, unnecessary roughness and, yeah. and pass interference. <laughs> Now we got a legal t- contact, you know, defenseless receiver, helmet to helmet. We got five variables instead of two. Well, quite naturally, they're going to be administered differently than there was when there was just two. So, I think that's happened. Uh, I think the motive for that happening was good, um, but you know, we got a lot of inconsistencies out of it as well. And in some cases, we're legislating against the player's instinct, and that is very difficult to do. Before I let you go, best nickname about you that you accepted and laughed at? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, the tuna, I guess. Did they say they have anything else that uh, they labeled you or that behind your back, maybe? Well, probably mostly <laughs> behind my back. Maybe in a closet somewhere, they would say it. But you were okay with Big Tuna? Well, you know, I didn't have any circum- uh, choice once the media <laughs> got hold of it. No, you got to be okay with it. Well, who started it? Uh, the New England players. You know, they were trying to get me to go down there and get sign up for that free turkey that didn't exist. <laughs> and I was kind of up to it. You know, I knew I knew what was going on, and they said, "Come on, why, why aren't you going to go down and sign up to your turkey?" And I said to them, mistakenly, "What do you think I am, Charlie the Tuna?" <laughs> you know, that, and that goes back to that Star Kiss commercial yeah. where Charlie was kind of a sucker. He would go and and he couldn't get, you know. <laughs> sorry, so, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Charlie. Wait, that's but that's true. what they pull on rookies, right? That they well, say I was a rookie coach. Oh. I was a rookie coach, 1980. They were, they were, and I knew it was something fishy because there were too many of them asking me if I signed up for the turkey. <laughs> uh, imagine if you'd just gone to get the turkey. What would well, they... then they, say, they video you. That's what that happened. I watched the video of the guys that went. But you wouldn't be called Big Tuna. No, no, they would have been gobbling after that. <laughs> well, have fun this weekend. Uh, Thank you, thanks for joining us, Bill. You're welcome. Good luck. All right. Bill Parcells, as somebody who survived a lot of those press conferences he was in, you know, maybe a better reporter because you had to be on your toes with him and Coach Knight. Oh, and they were looking for any loophole to say something, to embarrass you, just so they didn't have to talk about themselves or their game plan or their opponent.